Welcome to Kadampa Podcasts. These podcasts offer practical solutions to daily challenges and help guide us to a happier and more peaceful state of mind. In each episode, you will find an extract from a teaching given by one of various Kadampa Buddhist teachers worldwide. All these teachings are inspired by the profound wisdom of Venerable Geshe Kalsan Gyatso Rinpoche, a Buddhist master for our time. We hope you will enjoy listening. So usually what happens when we blame ourselves is we focus on some way that we've fallen short in our own expectations of ourselves. Right? So we have an ideal, right? And maybe it's it's not even that we aren't those ways some of the time, but in a particular instance we've fallen short. You know, maybe in an inter- interaction with someone on a given occasion, in a given situation, we've fallen short of the bar we've set for ourselves. And rather than just acknowledging that and thinking, yeah, that happens sometimes, or using that to kind of like come to a good conclusion, like, okay, I want to work on that, or I'm going to try harder next time, or, you know, that that's something, I, the, the room for improvement there. We kind of hone in on that where we've fallen short, and then we have magnified its significance and really identified ourselves to be it, like the fault or the mistake or the shortcoming. We think that's me. I am that. And then as a result, we blame ourselves. And then that as a result of that, you know, we don't like ourselves very much. If we're constantly fixated with our faults and our imperfections and where we fall short, if we do that a lot, we will be in a perpetual state of insecurity, actually. You know, just like if somebody is constantly berating you, <laughs> and unless you have like a really thick skin or you really give that person no power at all over you, then if they're berating you all the time, you'll start to like listen to their critiques or their, you know, criticism and you'll start to believe it. And then very easily it starts to be that in the presence of that person, because you feel judged, you're insecure all the time. So we can do that with respect to ourselves, where we're insecure all the, all the time in the presence of ourself. Because there's some like, hyper vigilant part of our mind that's constantly like looking for where we're falling short or where we're going to fall short. Like we're already assuming we're going to fall short. We're like, yep, you're not going to, you're not going to, you're not going to live up to, you know, what, what I want you to live up to. So this kind of blaming ourselves for our own mistakes and shortcomings and imperfections definitely reduces our ability to feel confident, increases our dis- discouragement. And then we can find that if we're not careful, if that's a kind of, kind of continual habit, that it really limits what we're willing to even begin to endeavor to do. Like where we'll have like a very deep tendency to quit before we've begun because we're going to fail anyway. So why bother trying? Or we won't even put ourselves out there for a new experience, a new interaction, a new relationship because we're like, oh, it's not going to work because I always mess it up, right? (laughs) Because I have all these faults and I never say the right thing and I never do the right thing, you know? So this kind of is is the effect of blaming ourselves, And then we can understand similarly when we blame other people, it's not so different. We've, We've focused on where they've fallen short of our expectations, where they're not meeting our preferences, where they're not meeting... Um, our what I what we've decided is our needs that they should be meeting right we we've we focused on that and then as a result we're blaming them for the unpleasant feelings we have with respect to it painful feelings we have you know we're blaming them for um, the actions they perform that caused us harm so then again um we can see that as long as we do that I mean in, in the case of others it's a little bit different than when we're blaming ourselves because with respect to ourself, we can always change, right? We can always change ourselves if we want to, but we don't have a power to change other people. So blaming them, thinking that's going to change them, is it just a dead end? It's like driving around a cul-de-sac, thinking we're getting somewhere, right? We're like, I'm just going to keep blaming you and hating you into trying to change you. Like that's going to work. Let me just do that a little more and see if that changes you. <laughs> it doesn't. Right. Just like we know, if somebody is hating us perpetually, how inclined are we to want to change? Right. If somebody's crit- criticizing us and blaming us all the time for their unhappiness, do we do we sort of like, oh yeah, you're so right. I'm so sorry. I'm gonna change. I'll never do that again. Probably not. 
right? Not unless from our side, we really acknowledge the truth of that and are ready to do, go in that direction. Generally, if somebody's doing that, we get defensive. And maybe sort of the worst version of those qualities comes out because we're in a, in a defensive state of mind. So we're less likely to want to agree, um, less likely to want to, you know, take on board what they've said and think that there's some merit to it. So this is where we can kind of see these this blaming mind goes. So then it's really important that we have a, some different ways of dealing with this so that we can change this, um, like I said, mental routine or habit of blaming so that we can begin to either not have that be sort of an immediate reaction where we're looking for somebody to blame. That would be great if that wasn't our just knee-jerk reaction. Um, but even more so that we begin to understand what to blame. What to blame. Because it may be kind of a far-fetched request to be like, okay, I'm going to stop blaming. And we tell ourselves, I'm not going to blame anymore. But maybe what we can begin with is I'm going to change what I blame. Like, can I Can I learn what to blame? Like what's to blame? So this is where there's a whole section in the chapter we've been looking at this month, uh, the chapter on how to enhance cherishing love. It's a whole section called Living Beings Have No Faults. And it's basically the keys, like the, the keys to finding peace in relationships, sort of keys to being able to forgive ourselves and others um, and learning what, what's to blame and what isn't. So there's many different sections in this um, part of the chapter that are really practical, really helpful that I want to introduce in the hope that some of this might be helpful, right? So you maybe not all of it is going to work, um, but there might be a few points where you think, okay, I can I can try that, right? That might be helpful. So the main theme, though, just as a general overview, is distinguishing between a person and their faults, ourself, other people, because at a, an occasion where we're blaming, we've we've had them be one and the same in our mind, right? The object to blame. Um, is the person and, you know, the faults is like one and the same. So we are to blame if we're blaming ourselves, or someone else is to blame if we're blaming them. And what Buddha said is we need to kind of create some distinctions. We need to have a little bit more of a refined perspective whereby we separate the person from the behavior that is to blame or from what we call in Buddhism delusions. Because from the Buddhist perspective on the mind, a person is not um, their deluded or negative states of mind. They are not their faulty minds. They are not their mistakes. They have them, right? They have them, but just having something doesn't mean we are something. So this is really where we need to start because Buddha is not acknowledging in those teachings that we're not responsible for our faults, mistakes, and shortcomings, and so on, or that others aren't responsible for, of course. But that doesn't require um, the the belief that we are one and the same with. So the example I like is, you know, you take any possession you have that you own that you're responsible for. You understand you're responsible for it. Like maybe you own a car, maybe you own a house, or maybe you own just really great stuff, like maybe nothing, just a lot of great stuff. You're responsible for your stuff. You're responsible for whether or not you keep those things, the state at which you maintain those things, whether you get rid of those things. You know, like your car, if it's your car and you own it, it's your responsibility. It's your responsibility whether it's clean or dirty or maintained or not or has gas in it or doesn't. Like there's nobody else's job to do that. It's your job. But you never think you're the same as your car, right? You don't look at your car and think me. Right. You look at your car and you think mine. You know, or you look at your shoes and you think mine. You don't think me. And you don't think you're defined by the state of your things, even though you're responsible for them. So say the state of your things is not great. You know, maybe your, your stuff's in disrepair. Right. But you, you don't think, oh, then I'm in disrepair. <laughs> you, you don't overly identify with your possessions. Well, at the same time, you acknowledge you're responsible for them. So using this as an example is very helpful because what Buddha is saying is just apply that to your mind. It's very much the same. 
So you're responsible for the state of your mind, right? For, for, for if you're the state of your mind is positive or negative or unpeaceful or disturbed, like nobody other than you can do, do that, change that. But it doesn't mean you are one and the same with different mental states. So say you have a negative mind and the faults that may be made as a result of some negative, unpeaceful, uncontrolled mind. You're not the same as those things. You possess them. It's your mind. It's your faults. It's your mistakes. But that doesn't mean you are those things. Like having mistakes doesn't mean you are mistaken. Having faults doesn't mean you're faulty. Just like having a car doesn't mean you are your car. So this is the, the kind of distinction we need to make. If we can make it with respect to ourself, then it really reduces um, the sort of discontent we might have or feel with respect to ourself. We can be at peace with ourself. And then, of course, we can apply the same thing to others. And we, we can begin to forgive ourselves, forgive others, understand there's a difference between a person and their faults or mistakes. So I want to just start with ourself and then we can like look at the reasons related to others. So it says here in the chapter, uh, the author Gishik Helsing, he says, recognizing that our fa faults are the faults of our delusions and not ourself prevents us from identifying with our faults and thus feeling guilty and inadequate. And it helps us to view our delusions in a realistic and practical way. We need to acknowledge our delusions and take responsibility for overcoming them. But to do this effectively, we need to distance ourselves from them. For example, we can think self-importance is presently in my mind, but it is not myself. I can destroy it without destroying myself. In this way, we can be utterly ruthless with our delusions, but kind and patient with ourselves. We do not need to blame ourselves for the many delusions we have inherited from our previous life, but if we wish for our future self to enjoy peace and happiness, it is our responsibility to remove these delusions from our mind. So this is where we begin as we think, okay, um, what do I blame? What, do I, what, what am I blaming? Like we take where we're at nor now, what do we, I normally blame with respect to myself? And can I begin to kind of distinguish between me, myself, and the unpeaceful, uncontrolled, negative, hurtful, harmful behaviors or mental states that I possess, I have. Can I create that distinction between myself and those things? Because that, that helps. Because at the moment, why they're one and the same is because we've identified with them. We've, we've mistakenly identified ourselves to be them. We're, we're, we're letting it define who we think we are, our faults, our mistakes, our shortcomings. We think I am that way. And we blame ourselves for those things. Whereas he's saying here, if we understand this distinction, it will prevent us from identifying ourselves in that way. There'll be this preservation of like a healthy sense of self-worth while at the same time acknowledging and take re taking responsibility for mistakes and things that we need to improve upon. So those can be complementary. They, they, can, they can coexist. We can coexist having a healthy sense of self-worth, confidence, while at the same time completely acknowledging and taking responsibility for the faults or negative minds we possess and that we want to get rid of, right? Because our possessions, we can get rid of them. If we were them, how could we get rid of them? We'd have to destroy ourselves, wouldn't we, in order to destroy those faults and imperfections? Which explains why oftentimes our approach to sort of self improvement or changing is to kind of beat ourselves up, right? <laughs> it's like sort of flogging ourselves, thinking if I just, you know, make myself feel bad enough about myself and just develop this, you know, exaggerated sense of being my mistakes and faults, then I'll destroy them. But all we really do is destroy our peace of mind with respect to ourselves in the meantime. And if anything, it becomes kind of a crutch or a reason to just continue those behaviors. Well, I, I'm already awful, so I may as well just continue <laughs> down this path of destruction. You know, I'm already to blame, so why don't I just continue? We, we're less inclined to sort of make a positive change, and we feel less capable of doing so 
Why? Because we've defined ourselves to be those things. So this is why this exercise is so important where we create this distinction. So there's different analogies that many of you have heard before you come to these classes regularly. You know some of these already, but and I'll mention a few um, later on with respect to others. But one really common one um, that I know we looked at, I think, last month is an uh, analogy Buddha gave to help us do this practice, which is a uh, blue sky. Right. So we are like a blue sky. Our faults and mistakes and the objects of blame are like clouds in that sky. It's like a storm in the sky. Right. So there's space in the sky for a storm. The storm never becomes the sky. Never becomes the sky. And we never think that the storm becomes the sky. You know, on an overcast day, we're not like fooled and think, oh, the blue sky has been destroyed by these white, fluffy, gray things that are raining down, right? We understand there's in the space of the sky, there's atmospheric conditions that come together that, you know, create clouds and create weather. And that's what we're seeing. So similarly, we have, we relate to ourselves as a blue sky. We think, okay, maybe atmospheric conditions come together in our mind. Maybe some negative karma, negative ways of thinking, you know, provocative situation, difficult person, disappointment, frustration. And it's like the perfect recipe for a storm in the sky of our mind. And then we've they temporarily become the storm, like I am a storm. And then we're just raining down on anybody who comes our way, you know, <laughs> and feel that storm. And it gets everything wet. And everything okay. In that situation, what's actually happened? A storm's formed, but the blue sky remains. So when those atmospheric conditions disassemble and, and the storm passes, the clouds abate, what's left? Blue sky. What was always there? Blue sky. What is never not there? Blue sky. So we try and relate to ourselves in that same way. We think in the space of my mind, there's this blue sky, right? That's That's me. And then these, these different things, it's like a storm. And if I really want this storm to pass, blaming myself and defining myself as the storm is not going to help it pass more quickly. It's like feeding the atmospheric conditions for that storm to remain. More humidity, more air pressure, more temperature, right? That's conducive to the storm remaining. So here, what we're trying to do is create this, this space, this gap, so in meditation, it's very helpful to meditate on analogies like this. If, if you're somebody who likes analogies, it's great. Just think, okay, can I, can I relate to what I'm blaming as in the clouds and what I am as like the sky? And can I be the sky instead of being the storm? Instead of embodying the storm, can I embody the sky and let the storm pass? Instead of grasping at the storm as me, can I actually identify with the sky? And then in that way, like he says at the begin, the end of the paragraph, Geshe-la, he says, then we don't need to blame ourselves. No blame. There's nothing to blame. So we just understand causes and conditions come, came together for some mistake or shortcoming or, um, you know, hurtful action. But that's not, you know, what I need to blame. So, or I don't need to blame myself. So this is another extension, this, this sort of this, if we created this distinction, then we're sort of safe to blame. Like if we, we've actually identified with the sky, then we can blame the clouds because we're not the clouds. So then we can have a really great time blaming the negative states of mind that took us down a path of doing stupid, harmful things. Like, yeah, then my angry mind, and I was bitter, and then I was jealous, and then I was petty, you know. And we're like, okay, but we're not blaming ourselves. We're like able to actually gain insight. We're like, yeah, what's to blame is those deluded, distorted ways of thinking, ways of viewing, those deluded minds, unpeaceful, uncontrolled states of mind, those clouds. So then we can safely blame, and it won't lead to that feeling of like being discouraged. If anything, it will lead to some feeling of triumph. And there's a very famous Indian Buddhist master named Shantideva, and he was kind of the king of doing this, where he would talk to his negative minds like it was a foe. And he, this is a very famous um, Buddhist poem um, called The Bodhisattva's Way of Life. And in this poem, he writes, you know, kind of like, narrates his way of doing this, where he's like, 
you know, talking, kind of like we call it like smack talking, don't we? I think in our society. he's like smack talking is delicious. <laughs> he's like, you will not defeat me. I will defeat you. I will be the victorious. He's like talking to those, those negative states of mind, like blaming them, blaming them of him for destroying his happiness, blaming him for destroying his relationships, blaming him for creating negative karma. He's like blaming those negative minds. And then what it does is it creates like a confidence in, I am going to defeat you. You will not defeat me. If you feel inspired by this podcast, then dive deeper into timeless wisdom of modern Kadampa Buddhism by following the link in the episode description. We look forward to reconnecting with you in the next episode of Kadampa Podcasts.